within the standard oh i see <laughs> in the within the standard model the standard model prediction can be represented in a few numbers of their input data for example at the three level we need only three param uh, three input variables we usually use uh, three input variables fine structure constant alpha Fermi constant gf and z boson mass mz and of course we need to include the radiative correction and there also we need something more which are alpha s and delta alpha hadron mtmh and so on and these data are used to predict the elect so called the electroweak observer which had been measured very precisely actually the sum of the rays are given here and by predicting the these electric pressure observer and compare them with the electric pressure uh, the experimental delta we can test the standard model and also if we predict in the within the some new physics model then we can test the, those new physics models and so oh, this is a very useful way to test the standard model new physics model and but uh, recently, as you know, as you noticed, the, I show the two experimented experimental data for double bottom mass here and here. Actually, sorry, sorry, okay. Actually, the recently, yeah, almost one year ago, sorry, the CDF show a new result about the double bottom mass. As you know, the PDG particle data group do not include the CDF result and give a result here, which is given by this yellow band. But this yellow band is not consistent with the recent CDF result, which is given by here, is is also here, the red bar. And also this CDF result is inconsistent with the standard model prediction, which is given here. Actually, if we compare the standard model value, with a PDG value, they are consistent to each other. Actually, the difference is less than two sigma level. On the other hand, if we compare the standard model and the CDF result, the discrepancy is about a seven sigma. So if this result is true, then this indicates a new physics. So it's interesting to revisit the new physics. Actually, in this talk, we are going to focus on uh, action-like particle. As you know, it's a pseudo scale number of gold boson associated to the unknown approximate, approximate global symmetry. And we consider this kind of the interaction. Actually, this is a minimal set of the model which contributes to the electric pressure observer. So we introduce the interaction, action interaction with the SU2 and the U1 gauge, coupling, uh, gauge bosons. And now in this scope, we revisit the electric pressure observable in action-like particle models, both with and without including a CDF result. So this is a content today. So today I'm going to revisit the action-like ALP contribution to the electric pressure observable. And actually you can find such a study in the in papers in previous papers, but uh, unfortunately you find the previous study like here, based on here, have missed three important points. So I'm going to, so these three points are the, first one is a radiative correction, which is not covered by S and T, the oblique parameters S and T and U. And the second point is that they missed the Z boson decay into action contribution to the, this decay contribution to the electric pressure observable. And the third point is that they didn't consider the experimental cons constraint in, in discussing the electric pressure observable appropriately. So we are going to revisit these uh, three contributions. And then we are going to discuss about our double boson mass and uh, also discuss the good goodness of the global fit and then summarize. Okay, so let's start from the LP contribution to the electric pressure observables. As I said, there are two types of the interactions. The interaction with the SU2 gauge boson and the coupling with the B bosons. And after the electric symmetry breaking, 
these W boson and B boson now decompose into the for the photon and Z boson and double uh, charge W boson. So we have now four interactions coming from the two couplings. Then by using these four interactions, we can calculate the vacuum polarization to the gauge bosons. And through these vacuum polarizations, the electric pressure observers are affected by LP. Actually, this kind of the new physics contribution has been historically discussed in terms of the oblique parameters. And the oblique parameters now- uh, excuse me? Yep. Can you reduce your, your volume a little bit? Oh, sorry. Uh, it's a microphone. Just a moment. Uh, how to change? Maybe audio. How to change? Uh, just a moment. <laughs> audio setting. Because the, your voice is breaking it. Breaking oh, it. I see. How about here? How about? Yeah, yeah, I think it's good. Yeah, okay. Okay, so the... Okay, so new physics contribution through vacuum polarization in many models, they are parameterized by so-called oblique parameters S, T, and U. Actually, the definition, the definition of the S, T, U like here. And through this S, T, U, the electric pressure of the double uh, affected. For example, the double bosom mass received a correction from S, T, U coming from new physics as here. And the, in the previous analysis, the LP is assumed to be, actually in the previous analysis, LP was assumed to be much lighter than Z boson. Then they calculated S, T, and U, and they obtained as here. Here S is given by here, which is proportional to Z squared and proportional to the coupling squared over the divided by the FA, FA is a nah, decay constant, FA squared. And T equals zero in this model. And interestingly, the LP predict the size of U parameters. Actually, you can see it's proportional to FZ squared, C squared over FA squared. So it's comparable to the S parameter, which is actually much different from the usual new physics models. And, but uh, the problem in the analysis is that they focus only on STU and they didn't, they ignore other contributions. That is a problem. So, and I'm going to explain this point. And, but uh, based on this assumption, new physics CDF result, new, sorry, new CDF result was also analyzed in the same approach. And the conclusion was that now, LP, right LP is just marginally acceptable to explain the CDF result. But I'm going to explain the three missing points, actually two of them related to the additional LP contribution to the electric pressure observables. So the first point is that the radiative correction beyond STU. Actually, in presence of the vacuum polarizations, there are radiative correction to gauge coupling constant, like here, alpha and mz and g, the weak boson interaction now received a correction here. So we introduced the three additional parameters, delta alpha, delta z, and delta w. Actually, by using these three contributions, for example, z pole of the upper will receive a correction here, the delta alpha here, appear here, and delta z also appear here. And W boson mass is also correct as here. The delta, in addition to the S and T and U, delta alpha cont also cont contribute to the W boson mass. An important point is that uh, in many models, these contributions are small, but uh, in LP model, this is not the case. Actually, we calculated those contributions as well as the S and U, S and T and U, 
And now our result is actually we check that our result is consistent with the previous result with respect to S and U, S and T and U. Sorry, the T equals zero. And we also calculated as delta alpha, delta Z, and delta W. And we obtain here its proportionality mz square. And uh, okay, so this is a C square over FS square with some coefficient. So it's comparable. New contributions are again comparable, comparable to S and U. So they contribute to electric pressure of the above. So, okay, so the second point which has missed in the previous analysis is that Z boson decay into LP. So we assume that the, the LP is lighter than Z boson. Then the boson can decay into LP and photon as here. Actually, in presence of the, the two types of the interactions, we can write down this diagram. And the, of course, this is a Z boson decay. So this process contributes to total widows of Z boson. And through this total widows, the hadron cross section, so called the sigma hadron, is also affected. So they must be included. And the important point is that this decay proceeds at a three level. On the other hand, vacuum polarization, the new physics control, the ILP contribution to vacuum polarization happens at a one loop level. So this three level decay is, the effect of this three level decay is stronger. So this is, has a large impact on the electric pressure of the bubbles. So, the LP contributions the electric, pre ele electric pressure observable are summarized as here. In addition to S and U, the delta alpha, delta V, and delta W, and also gamma as a Z boson decay to A gamma, all contribution, all, all, the, all, all of these corrections contribute to the electric pressure observable. And important point is that the new contribution affects the same set of the observable as the S and T and U. So they must be analyzed in the global field simultaneously. So we compare the, our result and those based on the previous study and show how important they are. So again, the LP is assumed to be much lighter than the boson. Then the result is insensitive to the LP mass. And this is a plot of the global fit, now the result of the global fit. And in the red plot, we include the CDF data for the double boson mass. And in the right plot, we, we do not include the CDF data in the analysis. And the green and the yellow represent the result based on the previous study. I mean that the LP contribute only bear the S and U. On the other hand, if we include all the contributions, then we get the red and the blue regions. So the new contribution affect the electronic pressure observable very significantly. Actually, this may come from the effect of the Z boson decay. So it must include. So then we are going to explain the experimental constraint, which come from the flavor and colliders. First, the flavor constraint, actually the flavor constraint is very, very sensitive to the LP coupling the double boson. Actually, if the LP couples to the double boson, we can write down this kind of the diagram. The LP couples the double boson and double boson couples the quark, then this interaction, this interaction can change, can violate the quark flavors as usual in the standard model. So for the case of the B meson decay into the LP and K, K meson, the decay rate is given as here. Actually, this effective coupling, oh, sorry, that this effective coupling includes, uh, depends on the action couples the W boson and comes through the loop at the loop level. And the, so B meson can decay to K meson plus action. 
And the signal depends on the action decay, uh, sorry, LP decay. Actually, when LP decay in the, into the diphoton, actually, Barbara studied such a study and placed a very tight constraint on the LP up to the mass less than 4.78 giga electron volt. And for action LP decay into the mu plus and mu minus, LHP studies such as studies such as signals and give a tight constraint on MA less than 4.7 giga electron volt. So LP is subject to very tight flavor constraint up to MA is about 4.8 giga, giga electron volt. In fact, this is a plot of the case of the MA equal 4 giga electron volt. And the, this red region and blue regions are the result of the electric pressure result, uh, precision observables. And actually, this red region is the same as the previous plot. But in this plot, we show the y-axis in the logarith logarithmic scale. And the, the flavor constraint comes from this line and this line. Above these regions, now regions are excluded. So as you can see, almost entire regions are excluded, as long as the flavor constraint is applied. I mean that the MA is lighter than about 4.8 giga electron volt. So we have to consider the heavier ALP to avoid the flavor constraint. Then next, we consider the Crider constraint. The Crider, in particular when the LP is lighter than the Z boson, then the LEP experiment plays a very tight constraint. For example, when a, the branching ratio of the a, a LP decay into diphoton is large, then the bound from E plus E minus to A gamma and again the A decay into diphoton, which comes, which is represented by this diagram, is very important. And there are two types of the rep data. From the rep one, the on shell Z exchange contribution has been discussed. I mean that this Z is on shell. In this case, now, Z is on shell, so Z decay into A gamma is as the analyzed. So the result depends on A Z gamma coupling. On the other hand, from the rep two, we have the off shell gamma and Z exchange contributions. Then in this case, both A gamma gamma and A Z gamma couplings depend, uh, the result depends on these two couplings. And so the result, the constraints are completely Complementary to each other. And this is a case of the branching ratio of A to, to gamma is of order one, but when this decay is suppressed, then we alternatively we alternatively obtain a band from the E plus E minus to on shell Z boson decay into A gamma, and this A decay into the Jet, die jet, and this jet come from the yeah mainly come from the charm coin, bottom coin, and so on. So this is the result of the MA equal five giga electron volt, which avoid the flavor constraint. And these red and blue regions, the electric expression of the result. And this blue band come from the rep one. I mean that the boson decay into A gamma and A decay into diphoton or digest. Now come and the this magenta region, magenta uh, lines are obtained by the constraint from the E plus E minus to A gamma and the A decay into diphoton. And the both constraint are satisfied in this CN region. So as you can see, this CN region is consistent to as, okay, so the electronic pressure result is consistent with this CN region only if 
the PDG value is adapted for the double boson mass. In other words, the CDF tension of the double boson mass cannot be solved if uh, as long as the ALP is right. So this conclusion is contrary to the previous analysis. So far, we discussed about the light ALP. So how about the heavier case? So the, we also analyzed so those cases and we provided the formula for any ALP mass cases. Actually, if you are interested in the formula, so please see my uh, paper. And again, in this case, uh, Z2 A gamma is blocked, of course, and also the new contribution now comparable to S. And now many there are many crider constraints come from the LHC. Actually, when A2 gamma gamma coupling is large, the this types of the contribution give a tight constraint. And when A to the gamma is a, a, a the gamma coupling is large, then we obtain the tight constraint from, from this diagram. So we show, let me show the two results the MA of the MA ALP mass about the a, MA equal 195 giga electron volt, about 200 giga electron volt, and they may call 600 giga electron volt case. In the rest of plot, so this shear region is again allowed by all the experimental constraint. And in this case, again, the electric pressure of the world is can be consistent with the Crider con constraint only if the PDG value is adapted. But if the, so if the LP is heavier, as a, heavier as 600 giga electron volt, then this tight constraint comes from the, yeah, so this is a new new gamma, new new gamma gamma constraint, which is here. In this case, this constraint is gone away. So we only have the constraint come from the photon fusion. Photon fusion is here, this constraint. And now we can, the electric pressure observer result can be constrained, uh, can be consistent with the collider constraint, both when the PDG and CD F values uh, adapted. Therefore, from this result, we can find that uh, we need very heavy LP mass. And also the LP coupling to the photon must be suppressed to solve the CDF tension. And now we come to the discussion about the double bosom mass and good, goodness of fit. So what is the goodness of fit? Actually, let me raise a question. So we show, so here we show the two results about the uh, MA equal five giga electron volt and MA equal 600 giga electron volt. And both region has the uh, 68% the probability region, which is given by the uh, Sika color region and the uh, 95% probability region which is given by lighter colored region. Both plot have the 68% and 95% region. So let me raise a question. So is CDF tension solved in both masses? So this is related to the goodness of fit. Actually, in the analysis of the global fit, usually, we we first co construct the probability distribution from the, from the likelihood as a chi-square. It's the it's a same as a usual chi-square. And construct pr probability distribution. But the normalization is unknown. So we normalize the probability distribution on model parameter plane. I mean that 
the plane of the GA gamma gamma and GAWW. Then determine the 68% and 95, 95% ratio. Then the 68% means it does not mean, does not always mean that the, all the tension existing the electric uh, existing the electric pressure observable. I mean that the, the all the tension between the standard model prediction and the experimental value of the electric pressure observable, all the tension are not always solved. This is big, but this means that the fit inside the 68% is better than the outer side. I mean that the, the, this is a relative. I mean that the, so we normalize the probability dispersion on the model plan, model parameter plan. So 68% and 95% region always exist, always appear on this plan. So 68%, in that case, 68% does not always mean that all the tension is solved. Therefore, the this no, CDF tension is not always solved. So let me, in order to understand the goodness of fit, actually, let's consider the available bosom mass. So okay, actually, the largest tension when when we, when we adapt the CDF value, the largest tension comes from the double bosom mass. So the goodness, goodness of fit can be understood in terms of double bosom mass. So this is a plot of the double bosom mass for various ALP mass. And the, this is a, this green band is a standard model prediction. And this CM band is a PDG value. And this Orange band includes a CDF result. And this black bar is an indirect prediction of the MW. So he, here, indirect prediction means that the, the, in the analysis, MW is predicted. I mean, that the MW, the MW is predicted by using, by using the global fit. But in the global fit, the MW information is not included in the likelihood in constructing the likelihood. Then we can predict MW from the other by using the other experimental data. So this is an indirect prediction. On the other hand, the red bar represents the theoretical value after the full fit. I mean that in that case, MW is also included in the likelihood. So this corresponds to the prediction, for example, in this red bar, red region. So let's consider the, this black and red values, theoretical values for various LP masses. So now we focus, let's start from the MA called 5 giga electron volt case, which corresponds to this plot. We find that the black and red bars, both black and red bars, now are away, uh, away from the CDF value. I mean that the so the goodness goodness of fit can is calculated from the this difference, the difference between the red bar and the this result, the this experimental data. Therefore, the goodness of fit. The, I mean that the fit on the, the fit quality is very poor in this case. So therefore, in Benzor, there is a 68%, the fit quality is poor. And this conclusion derived because of the Z and gamma restrict the fit. Therefore, the same conclusion holds as long as Z and gamma contribute to the electric pressure observable. So how about the heavier case? In that case, Z to A gamma disappear. The decay is blocked kinematically. Uh, okay, so this corresponds to the this plot. In this case, let's first consider this black bar and the red bar. In this in this analysis, we do not restrict the parameter region by the collider bound. 
Then, first, we, for, let's see the black bar. The black bar is an indirect prediction. And indirect prediction seems to be inconsist inconsistent with the CDF value, but you can find that the error bar is asymmetric. I mean that the longer bar exists for larger MW direction. So actually, if, if we see the probability distribution for indirect prediction, then the, the distribution has a very long tail towards large MW region. That's why the full fit, the red bar is consistent with the CDF value. Therefore, the fit quality is very good. As long as, but as long as the collider bounds not ignored. I mean that if we restrict the parameter region by the collider bound, then the parameter is restricted with this shear region, then the fit quality becomes again poor, unfortunately. So now let's consider the heavier case where the collider bound is greatly relaxed in this case. You can find, okay, so I forgot to mention that in this plot, I assume the, that uh, the to photon photon coupling, the coupling is assumed to be zero. Then, which correspond to this direction. So the LP model is free from the, uh, okay, the provider constraint is, is greatly relaxed on this di direction. Then, the fit, the fit quality is good. I mean that the MW tension is solved as, because of the red bar is consistent with the CDF result. So let me show the LP mass dependence of the elect electric pressure observable global fit. So this is the result of the including the CDF value and this is the result without including the CDF value. And here, the LP couplings to the photon is zero, assumed to be zero. And probability distribution uh, assumed to be normalized for each LP mass. Then, from the previous analysis, previous discussion, we can find that uh, in this parameter region, in this, sorry, in this mass region, because of this A gamma, if this A gamma decay, the fit quality is poor. And above this region, the provider constraint is very tight. So as for the PDG value for the W bosom mass, we need, so LP can improve the global fit if MA is larger than 160 gigaelectron volt. And as for the case, when the CDF value is included, then we need the LP mass heavier than the 500 giga electron volt. And above this value, the LP can solve the CDF tension. Okay, so let me summarize. In this talk, we revisited the LP contribution to electronic pressure observables. And we show, we pointed out the three missing contribution in the previous works. The correction, the first one is a correction beyond the SDU and the, okay, by through the back polarizations. And the second one is that the boson decay into the LP, which, which can affect the electric pressure observable significantly. In the third point, it's that they didn't included, they didn't consider the flavor and collider constraint in the context of the electronic pressure observable analysis of the predatory. And it's including these three contributions. It was shown that the electric pressure observable, electric weak pressure observable global fit can be improved much against a standard model if LP is heavy enough and the coupling to diphoton in GA gamma gamma is suppressed. And in particular, if we consider 
if CDF result of the double boss mass measurement is true, then the tension between the standard model and CDF result can be solved only when LP is heavier than 500 giga electron volt and the coupling to eta gamma gamma is suppressed. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. So now I receive uh, any questions. Okay. I, the, the, the interesting talk. Uh, yes, thank there's you. another problem with the, that involves that it seems to involve the W, and it would solve with the light axion, right? The, the neutron lifetime is different if you that's right. measure it in yeah. by exclusive by exclusive decays, and when you measure by uh, uh, attenuation, and yep. you get the wrong you get a different Kabibo angle from neutron decay than you get from kaon decays. Yep. So that would like a light, very light axion-like particle. Yep. So when you say it can't be less than 5 uh, GeV, does that mean it can't be very, very light? Like, you go all the way down to zero, or is it just it's small compared to 5? So you'd say 5? So it may call 5 giga electron volt case. The parameter region, the parameter region is here. Thank you for your nice talk. Okay. Yep, thank you. Okay, yeah, I have a question uh, about uh, muon coupling to this axion light particle because normally if you have a muon coupling included, uh, you could change the contribution to the muon demand. Muon demand. Yeah, yeah. Muon demand is good. Um, Actually, the, we do not include the, the coupling to dimion, the direct coupling to the, the mu mu in this talk. But uh, yeah, yes, the, if we include the ALP coupling to dimion, then the, that can affect the G minus two. And also that can affect the electric pressure of the bubble. I mean that, the, let me come back to the first page. So in this, the among the electric pressure observable, there are na, cup, the E plus E minus two na, lepton. Lepton means that uh, electrons and muon, those data are na, included in the analysis. So here AL and RL, now uh, depends on the e plus e minus two includes the e plus e minus two mu plus mu minus. So if LP couples to the dimion, then in addition to the vacuum polarization, the electron inflation observable uh, can be modified. So because uh, if some of your uh, constraints, like a yep. fiber or a collider physics, yep. You uh, assume some branching ratio. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Photons, uh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just that uh, sometimes you want to have primary coupling to the mirror and the photon. So. But uh, you are kind of you are assuming that this muon or like photon coupling to be small enough. Yeah, small enough. We assumed we assumed only na U1 SU2 and U1 couplings. Okay. It's a minimal setup. Okay. 
Hello, uh, can yeah. I ask a question? Yes. Uh, okay, thank you very much for a nice talk. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay, yeah, could you mention briefly about the so which renormalization condition you adopt and uh, cut off dependence of your numerical result a little bit? Actually, the, we adopted, okay, okay, so let me first show, oh, sorry, sorry. The, Okay, so let me first show that the result depends on the cutoff scale because that's the LP is, as you know, it's a it's a higher dimensional cell rate, so it's non renormalizable non renormalizable cell rate. Therefore, the result can depend on a cutoff scale. I mean that the features must be determined in a UV cell rate, and the, we adapted the dimensional regularization scheme. To regularize na to regularize na divergence, and in this talk numerically we assumed that. Okay, so for example, we assumed that the, the cutoff scale is equal to four pi times f a, and if we change this. Cutoff. I mean that uh, if we change, for instance, lambda the cutoff is equal to F A. I mean that if we remove the four pi lambda pi lambda, I mean that lambda. If we assume that the lambda over F A is equal to one instead of four pi, then the parameter region, the because the loop function depends on this cutoff scale, so the parameter region or the red and blue region differs. An in interesting point is that in the last plot, I show now this one, one dimensional analysis. And because of this cut of dependence, the, at some point, when if lambda equal FA, the, at some point, the loop function change the sign. Then the, in this case, in this case, Okay, so let me show the correction to the double bosom mass. In our choice of the cutoff scale, the all the this delta alpha and s and u positively contribute to MW, but once if the their contribution change the sign, then we cannot express double bosom mass dis discrepancy. I mean that now. Fit quality becomes poor. So, okay. If we choose lambda equal to FA, then the red and blue region drop suddenly, suddenly. And in that case, we cannot solve the CDF tension. So, the result, of course, depends on the cutoff scale. And if CDF result is very as uh, is true, then the probably the cutoff scale is probably is likely to be larger than the FA. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, it's uh, almost time is up, so let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me stop sharing. Next one. Next one is semi invisible P and how to pay at the Bear and Bell School by uh, Professor Young Jung Hwan. So today I'm going to talk about semi-invisible P and tau decays at Bell 2. Bell or Bell 2? Of course. Okay. Right. If you look at the Indico page, you will see that my talk and the next one has almost identical titles. <laughs> this is not coincidence. I just first take note of this 
Professor Chambon Park's talk title and then consciously intentionally composed my talk just to follow his theme. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about those topics. So today I'm going to talk about semi-invisible BDKs in the theme of B2K Tau L and B2K Miniva and semi-electronic BDKs, which is semi-invisible because of this neutrino. And then semi-invisible Tau DK, Tau lepton and alpha, alpha is any unknown neutral invisible particle. And one more thing later. Look. I'm gonna do. Click one. Okay, so this is Bell and Bell two experiment, but I'm going to skip this. So I'm going to skip this general structure part. And this is the Nobel Prize poster for the Bell measurement of CP violation. The Nobel Prize was actually going to the theorist Kobayashi and Maskawa in 2008. And another thing that I want to mention is that we have this. Uh, Ex exotic quaternion like spectroscopy, I mean, exotic particle X3872 and Z sub C4430. They were discovered by these two gentlemen and lady, uh, Sugyong Choi and Steve Olson. And we have also some good results on tau and two gamma physics. And this is now the Bell 2 experiment, which is currently in the middle of long shutdown one period, but maybe at the end of this year or early next year will resume running the Bell 2 experiment. The Bell 2 experiment is basically colliding electron and positron beam 7 GeV on 4 GeV. And this happens to be the resonance energy of the Upsilon 4S. And this is the old KKB collider two beams. And this is super KKB. And you can immediately see that, I mean, this is the design goal, but anyway, you can immediately see that once it goes very well according to the design, then we will have a very narrow beam that will help us increase the instantaneous luminosity up to 30 times. Then at the end of the lifetime of the Bell 2 experiment, we'll have complete, completed 50 times the data sample that we currently have with the Bell experiment. And this is at the end of last July when we started the first phase run. And so just before the, we went enter into the long shutdown period, we have accumulated 430 inverse femtoban solar sample, which is about 40% what we have accumulated in Bell. Out of this 430, about 360 is on Upsilon 4S. That's about one half of the sample that we have in Bell. So combining Bell and Bell 2, we have about 1.1 inverse autobahn data sample at Upsilon 4S or BB bar. Okay, and this is the so-called Bell 2 physics tree or physics mind map created by Tom Browder, our former spokesperson. And the message of this plot is just to give you that we have many, many diverse topics that we can cover. And today I'm going to select only very tiny subset of these. Okay, so let me start with the semi-invisible decay mode of B meson decays. And I'm going to tell you about two papers and a little more. Okay, so let me start with the B2K nu. In the standard model, B2K nu is expected to happen with about 10 to minus six branching fraction that was calculated by this gentleman. And this is sensitive to new physics beyond standard model particles, for example, laptop quarks or axions or any dark matter particles. In the standard model, this happens through the electric penguin or W box diagram, but any new physics particles may enter into this loop or inside this box. And so two years ago, Bell 2 has published a paper in PRL with a search for B2K new new with like about, I, I forgot the number, but yeah, like 70 or 80 inverse femtoban data sample. So the idea is that first we make a loose tagging of the 
loose tagging of the partner B. In all Upsilon first events, we have only two B mesons. One is the tagging B, the other one is the signal B. So we make tagging of the partner B, but not necessarily tightly constraining the tagging B, but just loosely constraining. Then we find K plus in the signal side, and we choose the highest transverse momentum trap with proper K on ID as our signal K. But we also require there must be at least one pixel detector shift, okay? And this is the PT distribution of K on. The red one is the signal, and the other one is the Monte Carlo background. That means this PT has a very nice information that we can use to separate or to kind of statistically distinguish between the signal K on and the background K or background particle. Okay, then once you, we do the step one, then we move to step two through seven. Step two is we take all other tracks and clusters. So first we loosely tag the partner B, then we select the signal K on, then everything else, what we call, is what we call rest of the event, our E. Then we use the boosted decision tree for signal discrimination. For this, we use the event shape and ROE dynamics and signal B kinematics and vertex information. Then actually this BDT is applied in two steps. So in the first BDT and second BDT, we do a consecutive application. So first we apply the BDT one, then select events that has larger than 0.5 nine something, I think it's 0.95 for the signal region of the first BDT. Then for those events that pass the first BDT, we apply the BDT again with the second set of the variables and that will be used as one of our signal extraction variable, the vertical axis here. Then another variable is the PT of the K-on. So with this two dimensional distribution, the signal mostly distributes in this range area, while the most of the surviving background distributes here. So we can have very nice signal extraction with these two dimensional variables. Then we check our BDT output with B to JSIK control samples for both the signal and background. And for this, we use the so-called embedding method, but I'm going to skip the details. Or if you ask a question, then I'll try to explain during the question and answer se session. Then we check the data Monte Carlo agreement using off presence data sample. Then finally, we apply simultaneous maximum likelihood to fit to on and off presence data. With the off presence data, we constrain the continuum background. Then for the on resonance data, we extract the signal yield. So this is the fitting result. The horizontal axis is PT in four different BDT regions. So this, this is basically two dimensional fitting result projected in two dimensional axis. Okay, and what you have to look at is this small tiny red part. This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, like that. They are the signals, okay? Then you look at whether this red part is larger than what is expected by the error bar, which is not. So that means we didn't see any signal. So we set upper limit. So upper limit is set with the CLS value, I mean CLS method. So our upper limit B to K nu nu is less than 4.1 times 10 to minus five, 90% CL. And just the error bar is that statistical error bar is a little bigger than systematic errors. So still we need more statistics. Okay, this is about one point. So in the previous slide, the red was at 4.9? 1. 1.9. 1. 1. Yeah. The red was 1.9. Then 1.9 plus minus 1.3 gives 4.1, okay? So if we compare our results with other measurements, the top one, red one is our result, Bell 2 is 63 inverse spent turbine. And these two blacks are from old Bell experiment with 10 times more data. And this one is BABA. BABA combined both the hadronic tagging and semi-electronic tagging. In Bell, we had two different measurements, one with semi-electronic tagging, the other one with hadronic tagging. So with 10 times less sample, 
with so-called inclusive tagging or loose tagging, our sensitivity is comparable to what we achieved with the bell. So this is very promising. So today I'm not going to tell you anything more, but please stay tuned for bell to update the results for B2K new news. We expect something to come in next month, okay? Okay, let me move to something else. Oh, this is one of my students in our group, Mr. Juno Park. He has been doing Bell 2 analysis for inclusive B2 XMS new new bar. So inclusive XMS new new bar is very tricky because we cannot tell, I mean, we include everything in XMS, so it is not easy to distinguish between signal and background. And new new bar, we don't measure directly. So this is very tricky. So his idea is, I mean, it's not his idea, but the idea is that we apply the so-called sum of exclusive method. Oh, not here. Okay, so basically what he is doing is old idea that was applied for clear experiment, bell experiment, but it was never applied to B2X of Nunuba. So basically he examined very many different possibility of XOS final states like K, K pi, K two pi in all these final states. And for each of them, he tries to measure X, the corresponding XOS new new bar, then he sums up everything. So this is very kind of laborious method and it is doing well. He has not looked at the real data yet. So, so far it is only Monte Carlo study, but the expected sensitivity is competitive with B2K new new bar, okay? So this is very preliminary, but I just wanted to mention because it, it is our group's work on it. Okay, let me move to another paper that came from our group, Dr. Shun Watanuki. It was not, I was not involved. It was him and Karim Traversi, our the deputy spokesman of the Bell 2. So they together, Measure, uh, searched for B2K tau L using the Bell data sample. The basic idea is that people were talking about until before November last year, uh, talking about RK, RK star normally in B2K LL, K star LL. So if there is, and Leptoquark is one of the promising suggestion for, to explain the RK, RK star, then if Leptoquark is available, then this kind of lepton flavor violating final state, why not, okay? So that's the main motivation to look for B2K tau L. So in this analysis, we use the hadronic B tagging using the special software called full event interpretation, which was developed for Bell 2 experiment, but nowadays many Bell experiment also borrows this program to do the hadronic B tagging. In this case, we use the hadronic BDKs for tagging, so the tagging is very clean, but we have to pay for loss of efficiency. The efficiency is on the order of 0.1%, 0.2%. So we lose 99.9% .9 of the data sample. <clears throat> and paying for that price, we get very clean sample. Then it is very easy to look for B2K tau well, even though we cannot really measure the tau because of the missing neutrino. By measuring the missing mass recalling against the kaon and lepton, we can look for the tau mass peak for the recalling side. So that's how we approach this. The important point to mention is that in this analysis, there are two different kinds of decay modes. One is K plus tau plus lepton minus. The other one is K plus tau minus lepton plus. Both are possible, but the background is so different between the two different decay modes. So we approach opposite side. I mean, looking at the k charge and the primary lepton charge, this is opposite sign. This is same sign. So OS and SS have so different backgrounds. So we optimize the analysis procedure separately and measure them separately. Okay. So we, I mean, this is the 
mass of the tau, the recoiling mass, and the signal is very sharply peaking around 1.77 GeV, which is the tau mass, and other backgrounds are very broad. But before any serious event selection, we start with this. This is Monte Carlo. So, and this small red part is the signal with some uh, unrealistically big branching fraction. Okay, so we have to fight against this background. Then we apply boosted decision tree, the machine learning program. Then we beat down most of the background and we are left with this signal. This is the case for OS and SS is a little bit more serious. Okay, so this is the result with the data sample. So we have electron mode, neuron mode, SS, OS, so four different combinations. And in all four different combinations, we don't see any signal in any mode. So we set upper limit. So these are the corresponding upper limits. So upper limits are around 10 to the minus five range. And if you remember what I showed in the previous page, the standard model prediction is around 10 to the minus six. So we are still one order of magnitude weight more to go. So anyway, the result is that the, we have obtained the most stringent limit on B2K towel in all four modes. And this result is based on phase space model. Of course, phase space cannot be true. So if it is not the standard model, then we should consider some new physics motivated model. But in our case, we also set upper limit based on new physics models. And in general, new physics models tend to have lower efficiency. Basically, we selected the most conservative way. So over the various parameter space for the new physics models, we select the point where the efficiency is almost the lowest. That's this point, okay? So it's not that much different. Anyway, so new physics upper limits are also estimated for models that gave lowest efficiency. And the paper has been submitted to PRL. And the first referee comment has been received just a few days ago. This is very optimistic, okay? Okay, let me move to another topic. That is B semi-electronic BKs, the typical B to CL new type or UL new type. In the B semi-electronic BKs, the recent concern is the so-called BCB, BUB tension between exclusive and inclusive measurements. So this is the average of BCB and BUB from exclusive measurements. And this cross point is the BCB and BUB average using the inclusive measurements. So the interesting thing is that for both BCB and BUB, there are about three sigma-ish tensions between exclusive and inclusive. Of course, BCB must not depend on whether it is measured by inclusive method or exclusive method. That means either experiment was wrong or theory was wrong or there is still something that we have to learn about. So this is a very important topic in that sense. So today I'm going to tell you about the most recent Bell analysis on B2 D star L nu. And this new analysis is focusing on the shape measurement. So in this case, we do not pay any attention to matching the overall scale. We only obtain the normalized shape. Then we feed back this shape information into, I mean, to compare with the lattice prediction and other theoretical models in conjunction with the externally determine the branching fraction. Then combining all this, we can extract the VCB value. So for this analysis, we use the hadronic B tagging again by using the FEI. And we characterize the one dimensional projections in these four variables. Those four variables are the W, that is the inner product of the velocity, four velocity of the B meson and the four velocity of the recoiling B star meson. Okay, and so W, then the other three variables are three different angles, the D star angles, lepton angle, and the angle between the two decay planes. So basically for each variable, we bin the sample in 10 bins. And then we make 
We don't have enough statistics to do the full four dimensional analysis. Instead, we analyze the four, dim four one dimensionally projected distribution. So they must be all correlated, very highly correlated. Nonetheless, we still try to make sense of these distributions. And this is the data versus Monte Carlo distribution. The points are data and the solid histograms are Monte Carlo. And this light blue, uh, light red colors are the signals. So basically more than 50% of the data samples are signals. So we don't really worry much about the background here. This is very clean. Oh, D star plus, D star zero, electron muon. D star plus, D star zero, electron muon. So there are four combinations, okay? So all the four things must be consistent with each other. Okay, then we subtract the background by doing the likelihood fit, mean the likelihood fit to M mass square, missing mass square. Since single neutrino is the only missing particle, the distribution must be peaking around zero. And this is a logarithmic plot, and we see very clear peak near zero. Then, so this is a typical example of W between 1.00 and 1.05 for D star plus electron neutrino mode. And this orange part is what is expected from the signal, okay? So this way, we obtain the data point in all 40 bins with four different colors. That means four different combinations like plus zero electron muon. And they seem to be consistent with each other. Then we take average of each four points and obtain this data points here in four different variables. Then we fit this against the theory par parameterization. For this, we use both BGL, Boyd, Greenstein, and Lebet, or CLN, Caprini, Lelouch, and Neubert models. So this narrow blue and orange are the BGL and CLN models. And this white green is just Lattice QCD predictions. So they seem to be consistent with each other. So from this, we extract the BCB value. And these six new BCB measurements are from this paper. The top two are BGL and CLN different theory based on the endpoint result, okay? One means W equals one limit, okay? We extract the limiting value using the shape. And these four blue measurements are just taking the whole spectrum of the W distribution. So they are highly correlated and kind of consistent with each other. And this is to be compared with other exclusive average from the world average, the heavy flavor averaging group. Okay, so our result is consistent with the existing measurements, but toward the inclusive measurements. So taking this results alone, the tension is reduced, okay? So that's the main message. And in this analysis, we measure some other things also, like difference of forward-backward asymmetry between electron and muon, the kind of lepton flavor universality, and difference of longitudinal polarization fraction between muon and electron, another lepton flavor universality. And finally, we also measure the ratio of B to D star E nu over B to D star mu nu. This is again, lepton flavor universality. And in all these cases, everything is consistent with zero, that means lepton flavor is universal, and one, that is again, lepton flavor is universal. So we don't see any evidence of lepton flavor universality violation in this analysis. Okay, let me move to another B semi case. This is related to RD, RD star. The bottom line is that if you take everything together from the exper world experimental measurement, we have this red ellipse, that's world average, and this is theoretical prediction for RD star and RD. By, by the way, RD star is D, D star tau nu divided by D star L nu, RD is D L nu, D tau nu divided by D L nu. So this is about 3.1 sigma difference, but if you take Bell measurements alone, the difference is only two sigma. Well, anyway, 
Today, I'm going to tell you about our first study towards the inclusive measurements of this R ratio, which we call Rx. So this is, in this case, we try to measure V to X tau nu over V to X L nu. But that result is not available yet. But as a first step, we try to measure X sub, mu, X sub E nu over X sub mu nu, which we call Rx E nu. In the standard model, this must be consistent with 1.0, very nearly. And it is usually predicted that the inclusive measurement has better precision than exclusive RD star or RD. So if there is anything lepton playable universality violating, then it should also show up in inclusive measurements. Okay. Okay, so the idea is that we don't pay attention to this, this, this task side. So we include everything, all different kinds of charm hadrons, and we just put together as X. Okay, so this is what you measure. That means we tag the partner B with hadronic tagging, then we only measure the lepton, and everything else is inferred by energy momentum conservation. And for fake lepton and secondary lepton contributions, they are normalized to data with the correction factor determined from fit to the wrong sign charged lepton. For example, if we tag the partner B as B plus, then signal size must be B, B minus, then the primary lepton must be L minus. So if you measure B minus together with L plus, then they cannot be a signal. So they will be a very nice control over the background and data Monte Carlo comparison. That's how we normalize the background sample. Okay, then we fit, I mean, we compare the data point with the expected background and also the signal contribution. So this is, uh, oh, this is electron mode, this is muon mode. And this light blue part is D, and this strong blue part is D star, or the other way around. I think larger one is D star, but anyway. Okay, anyway, this blue part is the signal, okay? So, this is, electron, this is muon, and this blue part, like dark blue part is for electron. So electron mode is interpreted as electron, and muon mode is elect interpreted as muon because we have very low fake rate between electron and muon. So electron cannot be misidentified as muon, muon cannot be misidentified as electron. So at the end of the day, our results are X sub E, over mu is 1.033 plus minus 0 .0, 0 0.010, 0 0.020. So at the level of 1.5 sigma or so, we have lepton universality preserved in this measurement. And this is compatible within 0 0.6 sigma with exclusive value measurement, or the star E mu, which was published in three years, four years ago. And once again, Please stay tuned for first bell, oh, by the way, this is bell two. First bell two measurements on R, R, X sub tau L. So this is what we really wanted to measure. And once again, this result might be released sometime next month. So please stay tuned. Okay, then let me move to, I have about 10 minutes, right? Five minutes, okay. So during the remaining five minutes, let me talk about semi-invisible tau decay. That is based on this well, two paper. So that is tau to, oops, tau to lepton alpha, and alpha is any invisible neutral particle. For this, we use the so-called one versus three topology. One is the signal size. The signal size is only one charge lepton, nothing else. Then three means for the, the other tau, because we always produce E plus, E minus, tau plus, and tau minus always in pairs. So one of them is signal tau, then the other one is tagging tau. And we only pay attention to the three prong tau. Then in that case, we have only one missing neutrino, but most of the momentum will be taken, momentum and energy will be taken by these three prong hadron, hadronic particles. So then the momentum 
direction of this, the magnitude and momentum direction of this three prong particle will be approximately close to the tau, taking tau particle. That's how we approximate the momentum direction of the signal tau. Then even with the missing neutral particle, we can measure this L alpha by using the recoil mass or the lepton momentum in the signal side. And these are the variables. Okay, so this is the idea. The signal tau momentum cannot be measured because of the missing alpha particle, but still using this tagging information, we can approximate the direction of the signal tau as the direction of the opposite to the direction of the tagging tau. And energy must be constrained to the half of the CM energy. Okay, then if you look at this normalized energy of the primary lepton, this is X sub E, X sub mu, electron muon. Then this normalized energy distribution depends on the mass of the missing particle alpha. So if the alpha particle has zero and mass, then the X sub E or X sub mu tends to be high. But if it is very high energy, then X sub E, X sub mu must be very small. Okay, so we can separate depending on the alpha mass. And this is much narrower compared to the background distribution. So this is how we select, estimate the signal. And we didn't see any signal excess. So we set 95% confidence level upper limit. The upper limits are normalized to tau to E nu nu branching fraction. So this normalized ratio is around 10 to minus two, okay? And if you compare this with the old, the only existing results from August, we are about factor three better, okay? And this result is based on very small data sample, only 63 inverse spam turbine. And now we have six times more data. And combining with the bell, we will have 20 times more data, okay? And one more thing, the final result has actually nothing to do with semi-invisible. Even though this is tau decay, we are looking for heavy neutrino, then my mix with the ordinary neutrino and decays to pi on and lepton. Okay, so the final state of this is tau minus to pi minus, pi plus L minus or pi minus L plus, depending on Dirac or Majorana nature of the neutrino. And this one has been searched for and we didn't see any signal. This is a background. I mean, compared to the background, there is nothing special in the signal region. So we set upper limit. So this is upper limit on the tau, I mean, the heavy neutrino mixing to tau and mixing to light neutrino. So basically heavy neutrino mixing matrix. So we set upper limit. So this is the upper limit as a function of the heavy neutrino mass. And okay, so this is what we have done. So after more than 12 years since shutdown, Bell is still producing more than 20 papers per year, which is, I think, not bad or good. In 2022, there was a tentative interruption due to the political reasons of paper publication, but now it is resumed with OCID kind of method. And Bell 2 has collected data sample of 430 inverse spam turbine and currently in long shutdown one. Combining Bell and Bell 2, we have 1.1 inverse R turbine at Upsilon 4S alone. And probably from now on, more analysis are based on combined data set of Bell and Bell 2. Okay, so please stay tuned for more news in semi-invisible BDKs from Bell 2. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your very nice talk. So any questions from room or from remote? Thank you for uh, your nice talk. So, uh, so you also mentioned about this uh, lepton flavor universality. Mm -hmm. So RD, RD star, mm -hmm. and Bell two. Mm -hmm. But uh, you showed electron to me on ratio mm -hmm. only yeah. today, right? Yeah. So you are, I, I missed the point, but uh, when, what is the prospect? But how 
Please wait one more month. One more month? Yeah, by, right. I, mean, I, I don't know whether I can say this, but something might be reported in the morning. Ah, yeah. the morning. Yeah. We are finalizing the analysis. Oh, if you look at the Baba webpage, they have accumulated 602 papers, 602 published and submitted. In, if you look at the Bell paper, page, we have 634. Last year, I think maybe less than 10. Any other questions? So, so when you talk about the K, B2K tau L. lepton, uh. right? so you said uh, about difference uh, uh. for efficiency factor uh. oh, for in the new physics model, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. the standard yeah. model right. background, uh, background yeah. in the process. Yeah. So can you say a little bit about the original differences is uh, due to oh different kinematics. Is uh, yeah. operators you have new operators due to new physics or ah basically according to Watanuki san who actually did this analysis, he did not consider any specific new physics model, but he did a generic parameterized approach. So if you look at various different parameters, that corresponds to different Effective. final state kinematics. Uh, uh, yeah. right, I see. Okay. Then we chose the point where the efficiency is lowest, most conservative. Mm -hmm. If the efficiency is low, then upper limit will be large. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, if uh, there are no more questions, uh, let's thanks again. <laughs> okay, let's move to next talk. First one is new approaches to my invisible tau and the BDKs by Professor Chan Bak. Uh, 
ich kenne das Bild von der Kirche mit Apfel und dem Bibelhof. Good thing about this uh, M2 variable is that we can add more and more kinematic constants to uh, calculate. So this M2 variable is uh, is not a, a single variable, but a, a, a family of a kinematic variables that are using this uh, that make them expanded by adding more and more. of the MT M2 corresponds to the uh, constant numerical minimization and also to the factors M2 variable uh, that we have to uh, draw in the experts that uh, in the software and uh, the good thing about this M2 is that the distribution of M2 is also bounded by the current actual mass and furthermore general for each event the, the value of M2 is larger than M2. And by adding more and more kinematic constants, uh, this makes the, the M2 distribution more sharply tipped from the, the upper edge. So the, we can, by this way, we can increase the sensitivity. Example is the spectrum light particle with the oxide. Such a light individual particle can be cut from the electron flavor by the process tau to L5, the L is the electron or the beam. And we had a bomb uh, already in this experience. This one is already cut by the Hartley and Alder and the Hill. Especially at uh, potato, the, the cross section of the, this uh, process on uh, 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 one nanobar will be very uh, uh, powerful. Uh, the 
Okay, come for us here, Oscar, please. Keep an eye on the ground. One of how you get into the five electrons is from electron or helium and a unique individual part. And the other how they keep ion and and the irreducible standard uh, background is the this project. How they do energy input. For this two signal and background, <coughs> we have an uh, identical event occurred. Right? So one of the how here I denote this how six they the visible electron, five electron and invisible five, and the third five of the how they to keep ion and invisible part. So uh, if we could reconstruct the momentum of the how six, this one, then we can uh, simply Because it's a two-modic space, and in the left frame of how we have a six-dimensional space, and as lepton colliders, uh, it share a little square root six, and then there in the three we have a square root six, and uh, in the even if we consider the central left frame of this because we like to reason who the the flying direction of the, this how is unknown. So the question is uh, how we should find the way how to get to the approximate how left frame. And one way is the, 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 the method uh, employed by the Argos that uh, we just use the, the keep higher uh, the next vector to identify the how we use this bit to be uh, uh, to the because how how uh, uh, for this is back to back so uh, we have a how six back to back another method is the, the by using the uh, cross which is a very, very long and variable by calculating for calculating a cross we have as the cross axis the And by identifying this n hat, we uh, identify this is the how uh, how six flying direction. Then we can have a how left frame. And in this two distribution, we uh, here we, we is using the, the so-called Argos method because by using the pi and the cross. Uh, by using this approximate uh, how left frame, we can. We can construct the how left frame, but uh, it's a, a little bit uh, spread. So uh, let's look at the, this event tabular again. Uh, by comparing comparing this uh, signal and background event topology, we can find uh, some biggest difference. So the signal has two individuals, five. Background has three individuals, three signals. So actually, this is the simple problem of the distinguish between two and three. And if we uh, consider the, the how hat came into lepton and helium signals, then this will be a, a problem of distinguishing three and four. So we should look at uh, look for the, the, the geometric difference relative to the number of individual parts. Uh, and it is known that the shape of the, the MPC distribution depends on the number of individual parts. Here, uh, blue uh, distribution, uh, this distribution is written as by the, the signal, and we have two uh, individual particles, and for this one, we have three individual particles. So the smaller the number of individual, the more the MPC distribution coupling width towards the, the upper end. So the idea is that uh, if we could use the, the M2 instead of this MPC, then uh, at first we should define which M2, which kind of M2 for this. Uh, 
So he proposed as a, an addict and two variables for him. Uh, as you see, the misuse of electron slide and the failed slide. Here, uh, at first we uh, used the, the transport momentum to split them into the, the, the three momentum. Because here we say at six, we use the, the, the split relation as a constant. By using uh, this definition of MQ, we have found that the, the, the difference between the signal and background can sum up compared to the, the amplitude. So the DYC plus the DYC could be much more efficient uh, in this signal. So MQ is this in a sense And another good thing about this MQ is that the, the, the solution at, at the end of the minimization to get the, the value of MQ, you, you can find the solution to the, the individual customer. And you, get, uh, you can say the MQ applicable to all shares. And actually, we could use the MQT instead of MQ, but uh, uh, we, we it is already known that the, the MQ based arguments are more efficient. By using this uh, uh, approximate uh, the individual momenta, mouse momenta, we can construct uh, the, the energy of the pipe magnet in the left hand and south hand. And on, on the right hand side, this plot uh, is uh, obtained is, is the energy of the, the pipe electron distribution by using the cross current algorithm. And compared to that, uh, this this one. And we also proposed uh, some uh, uh, field uh, variables in this side chain. Uh, the ratio of the minimum to the maximum. And this distribution of the side chain is populated around the one for the electric decay chain. And also, we could uh, uh, consider the, the ratio of the simple particles. And this plot shows that. And we also include uh, the, 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 in our analysis some variables that do not require the mouse momenta. One is the, the, the recall mass. Recall mass this is to induce the better mass in the full dividable system. And, uh, and, and missing energy. And these two are also very, uh, very good for the for background. So they are all uh, sensitive to the number of individual so we collectively we denote these kinetic variables as sensitive to the number of individuals and two by chain by C and recall mass and, and missing energy as the individual heavy CD in the slide. And in our analysis, we also include the, the, the heavy kernel uh, variables like the heavy electron moment and power dynamics. And this ROC plot uh, shows that the combination of the three, all these variables gives us a very good performance to this simple solution. And with some uh, benchmark style two uh, luminosities, we, we get the, 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 the final uh, luminosity target mu in our upper bound of the ranking ratio of 2000 uh, C5 to be like 2.4 times N plus 6 for N5 equals to C1 N. And uh, compared to the, the Traditional method, we have found that our method has been improved the upper by a factor of three. And next example is that the DPK tau mu, this was also nicely uh, reviewed by, uh, by previous talk. Uh, actually, the, one of the main motivations of the, this DPK tau mu was the case. Already from 
kind of the skill, uh, this uh, business data of you is very important process uh, for, for models with uh, restaurant flavor and so as well, uh, uh, we measure the product in a pair and uh, the strategy is similar. We divide this two B measures to be a signal side and test side. And on the signal side, we have a big mistake out of L. L is the direction of Leon. And on the tail side, uh, we can uh, consider any uh, uh, standard model process, but uh, typically we consider this is E5 or Hadron is that one. And this tau on the uh, on, uh, signal side decays into the final state, including the individual distribution. And this logic reduces to the bump pump by employing the uh, recoil mass for the tau. So in the uh, central mass frame, the recoil mass can be uh, expressed by this uh, equation. And as you can see, all, all the uh, quantities are all measurable. For instance, uh, energy over heat mass is measurable if you consider uh, hydraulic mass. And also uh, energy over phase shift electrics are also measurable. These are all measurable. And if we know the, the prime direction of the uh, excited unit, we can also uh, measure cosine of that in the So in the hydraulic test, uh, everything is okay, but we consider a, a, a semi-mechanic test. For instance, this will be a U. Then we have EQ material, so we cannot uh, uh, reconstruct the, the prime direction of the EQ. In this equation, we have to find a way to get the cosine of the value. So, so to, uh, to calculate the value of cosine of the we should uh, uh, estimate the, the, the value of the momentum direction of the heat mass. And to calculate this one, we have to uh, uh, add integral part to it. <coughs> so, so strategy is the same. So we construct the MP uh, medically to, to uh, be measured uh, given and use the mouth momenta uh, as estimator of the heat mass. This way we can uh, uh, calculate the heat mass. Okay. The question is that which constraint for for you uh, divide this as well. We could also use the, the previous one, the previous uh, MP definition for the lepton slider, but we can do more here in this case. That is, because we know the, the mass of the B mass, we, we can use this uh, uh, potential condition for the B mass into the definition of the then, uh, if you see carefully on this uh, definition, actually, this all this constraint reduces the zero, the number of degrees Celsius. Initially, we have eight unknowns, but by choosing the, the, uh, the mass of the middle particle, we have six unknowns. And by uh, using these uh, uh, constraints, finally, we get the uh, zero degrees Celsius. This means that this new definition of M2 is not a distribution. Actually, a solver for for the constant distribution. And another uh, possible definition for M two is that to use the, the vertex information of the B measure. Here, uh, uh, V C is the, the prime direction of the parent B measure. And this can be uh, uh, ex can be uh, determined by the Location of the primary hot X, that is the interaction point, and the location of the BC, which is the vertex. And this constraint could be implemented as the inequality function, uh, this one. This uh, could be an inequality function because uh, the, there are some experimental uncertainties on the, the location of the primary and secondary state. So, uh, Instead of uh, over this, instead of this onshore relations, we can add the, the <coughs> vertex 
contract, but it's not our customer. We call it the sales. And in the case of uh, NFC, uh, the sales is elastic, so we can only the interact contract. So in this case, we can call this uh, the sales until we are in full sales. And in our analysis, for simplicity, we replace the, the true This limit, uh, this inequality constraint becomes the equality constraint. So it's uh, easier. So uh, <coughs> by using some Monte Carlo data, uh, we uh, constructed this uh, helicoid division uh, using the power of Monte Carlo. And finally, we get uh, some uh, nice percent of the confidence level of a bound. If we use the, the, the true moment of individual particles, then, then we could have the, the, the 0 0.6 times 10 to the minus 5 of the, the moment. So, uh, conclusion, uh, the MP2 and its generalization M2 for the consequences of uh, high EP index, uh, such as hypothesis of heavy particles and spectral particles. We hope this ideal to low energy process density from uh, colliders is certainly very effective. And we devised a novel uh, surface surfing that we can apply to self production of power and beam energy, how to create L5 and MP2 particles. And uh, we think that uh, our strategy as a right domain of applicability, like the EP3 mu mu and EP tau mu, uh, is on MP and A. Thank you for your time. Thanks for nice talk. <laughs> so, okay, if you ha anyone have a micro mic? I'm sorry. I'm sorry for asking fundamental. Uh, I'm sorry for asking fundamental questions before the, your content. But can I confirm that for both Bell experiment and LHC experiment, and if we, I only think the detector side without the kinematics uh, for visible particles we can know the energy deposit and the transverse momentum, but we cannot know the longitudinal momentum of the visible particle. Uh, longitudinal momentum. Oh, I see. Oh, we can know the... Yeah, invisible. Oh, I see. Oh, so that uh, maybe from polar angle, polar angle and... Oh, we can know directly longitudinal mo momentum also. Oh. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. Oh, so could you pre please tell me why, for example, LHC analysis, for example, we only consider the transverse momentum and sometimes we ignore the longitudinal momentum? Ah, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, LHC, for example. Uh, 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 I see. 
Yeah, right. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, right. But I thought that uh, if we to, for two to scattering, maybe if we know the uh, transverse momentum, and uh, if we know the polar angle, we can directly derive the longitudinal momentum for a uh, uh, visible particle. Oh, yeah, I see. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for uh, your nice talk. Um, I have a question. Uh, Basically, for example, for MT2, it depends on the test methods, right? You have to, to choose uh, mass test in order to do the, the optimization algorithm. Uh, for M2, is it the same case or? Yeah, yeah, basically you can choose zero or whatever value and then you optimize the, the, the variable. Uh, my question is, uh, how how sensitive is the M2 variable on the choice of the test model? Yeah, there is a choice of the Uh, we know actually that we can reconstruct the total momentum in uh, with plus and minus collisions, but there are some there are some scenarios because the there is a limited resolution efficiency blah blah blah, and sometimes when you apply a, a selection cut, somehow you you just you know you have a particle, then we impose the cut, then you have nothing in the event, which basically can causes some imbalance on the total momentum, or maybe can even drive the, for example, the total imbalance mass or the invisible mass to negative value. Uh, like for example, you use like the conservation of the core momentum, and then basically from this simple equation, you can calculate the invisible mass. But then at the repo level, you have some, sometimes some, you know, some mistag inefficiencies and so on. And this basically can causes the, that given event, so basically that you don't have a particle in that, so will imbalance the, the total invisible mass. So what do you usually do in this case? Yes, yes, yes. Any other question, please? Okay. Uh, thank you for your interesting talk. Just uh, I'm comparing with Professor Guan's uh, limit on the B2K mu, uh, D2K tau mu muon, right? So in your case, it is independent of charge of the final state, right? No, it is, it is. Yeah. 
kind of average value between the different charges, if I compare to the surface points region. So, okay. So if uh, no more questions, uh, let's thanks again to speak.